Well, good morning, everyone. Hopefully I'm looking at the right camera, this one here. Excellent. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, again, and welcome to Church Online at Harborside Studios. <laughs> it is good to be here. Uh, let me ask you a question. How are you at waiting? What are you like at waiting? How are your patience levels? Are you any good at waiting? My, my guess is, I think a majority of us, maybe not so great. I struggle with this waiting. It's not something I do easily. I think we've just become so used to having things immediately, so quickly, haven't we? Uh, it's easy to see in others, isn't it? Oh, they struggle with it. And it's certainly easy to see in kids. I see it in my kids, they're all under 10, three of them. And this idea of um, delayed gratification of waiting is pretty foreign to them. Now we're talking at the moment uh, as a family about getting a puppy, big decision, big decision. We're taking our time, right? Because it's like getting another kid, three is already a lot of kids, right? And so we're thinking it through and the fact is there's no puppies left in the state of New South Wales anyway since shit lockdown everyone went and got a puppy so there's none left anyway so I'm trying to tell my kids look even if we say yes today it's going to be a few months at the most oh, sorry at the least rather until we get a puppy and they just look at me like with these expressions months they don't get it my daughter who's seven looks at me and says months daddy you make me sad when you say that and it's I'm sorry lover <laughs> Nothing I can do about it. It's just delayed gratification. It's waiting. She doesn't like it. I, I don't like it much either. Not very good at waiting. We don't like it because we want what we want now, don't we? Not comfortable with it. Now, this is true when it comes to smaller things or medium things like getting a dog. Smaller things like, I don't know, waiting for something you've ordered online or waiting in a queue. No one really likes that. Some of us are better than others at waiting. But it's certainly true for the bigger things too, isn't it? waiting for him, waiting for her, waiting for a promotion, a move, just waiting for someone or something to change. You know, when it just seems like it's not waiting just for something, it's, it's our whole life is waiting. We feel like we're in a holding pattern. We feel like we are just, our lives are on hold, a transition period. We don't very much like being in those times because they're confusing and they're disorienting times and we just want to get out of it. It's kind of like being in, or feels like being in a boarding lounge. Remember those things at the airport? Remember we used to go to them and go on big metal things called airplanes, you remember? Like being in that boarding lounge, looking at the airplane. No one wants to be in the boarding lounge. You look at the airplane, you're waiting for your, anxiously, waiting for your number or whatever they call to be called to get on that airplane, to get on your destination. No one likes camping out in the boarding lounge, particularly if you're poor like me and can't afford the nice ones. No one likes camping out in the boarding lounge. No one enjoys that. But here's the thing. There's a danger for those of us who aren't good with waiting who struggle with waiting. Because when we are faced with times that feel like a hiccup, feel like a transition, feel like we're in a holding pattern, we're gonna be tempted to really not wanna be there, just to focus on getting out of there and not spending any time thinking about what could happen in that moment. And if we do that, I think we're gonna miss the potential gold in the ground. As John Lennon famously said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. That's true, isn't it? I really resonate with that. And as Christians, even more so do we agree with this because we believe that nothing is wasted, that God can and is working through all of our situations to grow us for good, to shape us into the people he wants us to be. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning, and that's where we find our main character in this series we're in, Joseph. We're in week four of our series called The Dreamer, the story of Joseph found in the book of Genesis, and this is where we find our main character, Joseph, this morning. In prison, suffering unjustly, waiting waiting to be vindicated. And as he does, as he is waiting, he is growing, maturing. God is working on his character. See, it's in the waiting that God does his work. It's in the waiting that God does his work. 
Last week, we left Joseph in prison. Now, going back a little further, a bit more background, Joseph is one of 12 brothers who is absolutely the darling of his father. And his father makes that obvious by giving him a special coat, an ornate coat, a robe. And the brothers hate this. They are incensed with jealousy and envy. So much so, they try to kill him. And they don't kill him. They sell him into slavery. And he is then sold into the house of a well-to-do Egyptian called Potiphar. And that's what we talked about last week. Andrew spoke to us so well about that last week. God blesses Potiphar's household through Joseph, but then he is a victim of harsh circumstances again and ends up in prison. Yet God has not left him, even in this hardship. The narrator makes it really clear that the Lord was with him, still, even in prison, and blessed everything he did. Okay, that takes us to today, chapter 40, that was read so well for us by Dinesh. What happens in our chapter? Well, some time later, we're not told how long Joseph is in prison until this point, two high-ranking officials from Pharaoh's court end up in prison with Joseph. And the head guard says, well, you can take care of them. As in Potiphar's house, here in prison, Joseph is given extra responsibility. We don't quite know how, but he seems to shine outshine everybody else and people just give him more and more responsibility. He's a person you can, be rely, you can rely on to get things done. So these two officials come in, they are put under Joseph's care. Now we meet two characters in the story, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. Now these roles sound pretty insignificant, but they weren't. If you wanted to assassinate a pharaoh or a king, the best way to do that was to poison them through their food or their drink. And the chief cupbearer and the chief baker were responsible pretty much for everything Pharaoh put in his mouth. So these are very high, trustworthy people, very high status jobs. Now, while these two men are in prison, they have significant dreams on the same night. Joseph is put in charge of taking care of them. So he goes to see them uh, the morning after their dreams. He sees they're upset and he asks them, what's wrong? Now, they're really sad. They're downcast because they've had dreams that seem weighty. They're significant. But they think nobody in this prison is going to be able to help us with that. Maybe in Pharaoh's court, there were people you could go and talk to about significant dreams. But they're isolated from that. They're in prison. Who could possibly help them? But as you and I know, Joseph has some experience with dreams. Joseph says, well, my God can interpret dreams. Why don't you tell me them? And here we just have the main, well, one of the main themes of the narrative just hit us in the face again. God is again moving the story along. Now think about it. These two particular men come into the prison Joseph's in. I'm sure there were lots of prisons in Egypt. They come into this particular prison and are put under the care of Joseph, not somebody else, under Joseph. And while they're there, they have dreams. Of course, Joseph has a lot of experience with dreams. We just see God is orchestrating this whole thing. Now, the cupbearer goes first. He tells his dream about uh, vines and branches and grapes and cups. Joseph interprets the dream that in three days' time, Pharaoh will restore him to his old high position. It's a story of redemption for the cupbearer. And then Joseph reveals some of his personal journey. It's, I think maybe the first time Joseph, we've, he's revealed what's going on in his mind. Verses 14 and 15 are quite key to this whole section. He says, remember me. I've been enslaved against my will. I've been put in prison unjustly. I've done nothing, nothing wrong. When you get out, when what I say comes true, remember me. I've shown you kindness. Will you show it to me back? Remember me. Well, then the chief baker tells his dream. He sees the cupbearer got a good interpretation. Oh, I'm, hopefully mine is too. Doesn't work out so well for him. Joseph interprets his dream, which has baskets, birds and bread, that in three days time, Pharaoh's going to sentence him to death. And both end up being true. The chief cupbearer is restored to his previous high position and the chief baker is executed. And we're left at the end of the chapter with this, verse 23. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. No! <laughs> Ouch, right? You're supposed to feel that. Oh, poor Joseph. I mean, after all he did for this man, he cared for him, he came to the prison, he cared for him, he gave him the correct interpretation of his dream, calming his anxiety most likely, 
and he forgot him. Joseph remains in prison from the beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter. You'll notice Joseph's geographical position does not change. He's still in prison. It's a pretty tough season for Joseph. Imprisoned for something he didn't do, enslaved against his will. Not a good season for Joseph, is it? Now, if we step back and look at the bigger picture of Joseph's life, which I think we're meant to do, we can see this is a season of waiting for Joseph, of preparation, of character building. Now, I think it's important to point out here, it's not necessarily... Joseph wasn't such a terrible person that he had to endure 11 years of slavery and being in prison and he had such hard edges to his character that needed to be knocked off. I don't think that's true. I don't think we get that idea from the narrative that he was such a terrible person that had to be transformed. No, no, no. But think about this. We'll see this in detail next week. What God has in store for Joseph is extraordinary. He becomes Prime Minister 2IC of the biggest empire in the world at that time extraordinary position. He needed extraordinary character formation. Psalm 150 verse 19 says that the word of the Lord was testing Joseph at this time. Testing. Now if we believe that, which I think we can, if we believe that we can say that what God had Joseph doing in Potiphar's house and not doing, and what he had him doing in prison is not wasted time. This this is key. Please just remember this. This is key. What God had Joseph doing was not wasted time, but critical character formation in preparation for what is to come. But I reckon if any of us were in Joseph's shoes, I think some of us can relate to this, we'd struggle to see it that way. And you know what? Maybe Joseph did too. Verses 14 and 15 give us a bit of a hint. He was struggling. What am I doing here? Get me out. Serving God faithfully while we are waiting is not an easy thing. While we feel like we're waiting is not an easy thing. I believe it takes God-given perspective. I mean, that's what I want to focus on for the remainder of the message today. It's what I want to focus on. It's in the waiting that God does his work. Does he do his work in other times? Of course, absolutely. Absolutely. But God could do powerful work in the waiting. It's in the waiting that God does his work. So what do we do with that? Because unfortunately, if you're anything like me, we can miss these times. We think they're a distraction to the main event. We think it's a hurdle to the real thing. It's just a little thing to get through. I don't want to spend any time here. I'm focused on what's ahead. Treat it as a sideshow to the main event. We can do that. Let me try and illustrate this. Probably um, maybe the second last year we were in the States um, trying to make it in the music, music industry. I sat down with a mentor of mine, an older pastor that I really trusted. And, uh, you know, I was going through a pretty difficult time. I sat down with him. We had a long conversation. I just shared my heart. I shared that um, tensions in the band were at an all-time high. We weren't getting on great at that point in time. Now, of course, when you're living in each other's pockets, you get on each other's nerves, but things had become not great. A lot of tension, and we also had different ideas of what our future might hold. So I was sharing that, and that was weighing pretty heavily on me. We really weren't getting on super well at that time. And I was also sharing about my anxiety for the future. What's it going to look like? You know, trying to make it in this fickle music industry, trying to write hit songs and hit albums and trying to do this and having little control over a lot of it, it felt. I was just sharing all of this, just sharing my heart with my mentor. And um, he said something that was pretty hard hitting that has stayed with me. He said, what if God cares more about how you treat your bandmates than if you have a hit single or not? What if God cares more about what goes on in that bus, how you treat your bandmates, than if you have any success in the music industry at all? <laughs> wow, that one landed. That's, that was a combination of encouragement and rebuke right there, and I needed to hear it. That really hit me. You see, treating my brothers in Christ with love was not a new concept for me. I've been a Christian for a long time. But I've got to admit, I'd absolutely lost sight of that being close to important. I think we all had. And because we were just 
in pursuit of something else, but in reality, in God's economy, may not have added up to much at all. You know, I had viewed the time we were in at that point almost to be a useless waiting room, just waiting waiting around until something exciting happens. You know, what we're going through, useless waiting room, we're just waiting for something exciting to happen, the real thing to happen. But what if the most exciting thing that happened at that time in our lives, for me, was that I learned how to really deal with conflict? What if the most exciting thing to happen was I learned what true humility was? What if the most exciting thing to happen was I learned what it meant to repent? I learned what it meant to ask for forgiveness. We all learned what it meant to practice and live reconciliation. It may not sound as exciting as a successful music career, but maybe God cared a whole lot more about that than anything else. You know, I wonder if you can relate to something like this. Maybe something in your past, maybe something in your right now. Because we've all experienced a curveball lately, haven't we? I don't want to talk too much about COVID, but let's face it, it feels like a lot of our life is on pause. Some of us might be tempted to view this season as just something to get through. Let's just get through it, and I totally relate to that. Let's just get through it until real life resumes. But guess what? This is real life. Don't waste it. Yeah, I don't know what's going on for you, but maybe in this time, some things have come to the surface, some things that aren't that pretty, some things that might actually be quite ugly, things you need to address. It's probably not an accident. God might be calling them to your attention. Maybe it's a personal struggle. Maybe it's a particular relationship. Maybe it's your relationship with God, with him. Don't waste this opportunity for God to use whatever it might be to grow your character, even if it's painful. You know, I like this quote, uh, where you stumble and fall, there you will find gold. There's a lot of truth there, isn't there? Don't be so quick to get up that you miss what's really there. You know, the Apostle Paul endured an enormous amount of hardship as he was planting churches and preaching the gospel around much of the known world in the first century. But God gave him a God perspective on what he was going through. And he talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says this, but this happened, talking about all the hardships, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Think about that. God used the difficult, like the really awful things in Paul's life to draw him closer to himself. But here's the thing. You and I, we're going to have difficulty seeing things like this if we are struggling to trust God, right? If we're struggling to believe that he's in control, if we struggle to believe that he has our good as a primary goal, if we distrust that, we're going to be very uncomfortable with our current situation. We need to be reminded that God does his work in the waiting, absolutely, but God is with us in the waiting. We need to be reminded again and again that God can be trusted. We're not on our own. Jesus Christ came to dwell with his people. He is with us in whatever we are in and has promised to never leave us or forsake us. He's promised to be with us while we are enduring it. If you've got any doubts about that, look at the cross. Look at what he endured, as Dinesh was reminding us before. Look at what he endured, dying on the cross in our place while we were still enemies to him. So my hope and my prayer in this season is this. In this season of change and waiting, that God would use the mundane, been plenty of that, he'd use the mundane, the unusual, the different, and the really terrible, the really hard things to grow us, to shape us, and bring us closer to him and more like Christ, which we know will be 
for our good.